Good evening. This is Assemblywoman Kari Petrie Norris. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Relationship violence impacts far too many, and it's a cycle that can be incredibly difficult to break. I am really pleased to be able to focus tonight's conversation on this subject, to raise awareness and to talk about how we can decrease violence in our communities and build healthy relationships. I'm so pleased to be joined tonight by the Chief Executive Officer of Human Options, Maricela Rios Faust. Maricela, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Assemblywoman. I appreciate it. And now, before we before we jump in, can you tell us uh, a bit about about Human Options and the work that you do to serve our community? Sure. If I can share my my, uh, my screen in a minute, I was going to share a couple just facts about Human Options and the work that we do. Couple of things, um, human options, um, why we exist. One in four women and one in seven men experience relationship violence. Uh, a third of the calls to Orange County 911 for domestic violence are made by children. Uh, domestic violence cost employers nearly 727 million in lost productivity a year. And 33% of adolescents in the US are victims of sexual, physical, verbal, or emotional dating abuse. Our mission is to ignite social change by educating Orange County to recognize relationship violence as an issue that threatens everyone, advocating for those affected by abuse, extending a safe place for victims, and empowering survivors on their journey of healing. Our impact, as you can see, we've had a, a, a number of um, great statistics to share. The one I want to highlight is really the 94% of transitional housing clients moved into permanent housing. What, what we often find is many families or many women who are in abusive relationships do not leave the abusive relationship out of concern of becoming homeless. It is the second fear other than safety um, for women who are in abusive relationships. What we have found is by using a domestic violence housing first model that focuses on mobile advocacy, providing resources to um, financial resources to be able to put toward any barrier that would keep them from working and maintaining housing um, will help them maintain, stay in stable housing and live violence free. So 95, 94% into permanent housing is a huge statistic that uh, is important to note. And it's, it's partly because we've put a model in place where we partner with the homeless service provider and other agencies. So we provide the domestic violence counseling services and, and um, educational resources while somebody else helps do the placement into permanent housing. And then lastly, I wanted to share um, what, what's really been key for us during this time has been making sure that people have a hotline. And so I wanted to make sure and share that with everyone today our hotline number is available 24 hours a day, and it's 877-854-3594. Um, that's a little bit about human options and who we are and, and what we're doing here in Orange County. Well, thank you for that. And thanks for, for all the work that you're doing and for the in innovative uh, and effective model that you're, you're pursuing. Uh, so some of the statistics that you shared are just, I mean, it's just staggering. I, I think you said it's one in four women and one in seven men who will be the victim of some kind of relationship violence in, in their lifetime. And um, I think you know, a, a point that's important to make is also that it's, it's an equal opportunity. It's an equal opportunity offender, right? Uh, so right. It's, one of, it's one of the few things in, in our, you know, it's one of the few things doesn't, ma doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, uh, you know, doesn't matter if you're you're black or white or in a, a straight relationship or LGBTQ. Um, it really does impact everyone. And you know, what are some of the the misconceptions that you feel like people have when when we sure. start to talk about relationship violence? Sure. So when we talk about relationship violence, I think a primary misconception is that abuse is only physical. And that it occurs, you know, it's it's somehow that the person who's being abused should have just known, right? That, that it's like, I would never allow myself to be in an abusive relationship. Um, you know, we actually in the last couple of years have broadened our language to be more focused on relationship violence than domestic mm -hmm. violence 
partly because of that physical element. Um, when you talk about domestic violence, I think there's this idea, and, and I don't know if you've been in a room, but I, I, get, I have an opportunity in several rooms when I say domestic violence and people will either tune out or say, oh yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I think the misconception again is there's, there's a, a limited understanding of the psychological abuse that occurs in abusive relationships, the uh, emotional abuse, and then also financial and um, so there, it's across a spectrum. So when we think about psychological abuse and emotional abuse, it's those subtle things that, that are in the beginning of a relationship. So when, we, when I've heard um, individuals say, well, I would never allow myself to be in that relationship. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to talk about, you know, it's not like somebody shows up at your door and you get in the car for a first date and you automatically and you get a slapped right away. That's not how this works. It's something that's much more subtle where it might be, oh my gosh, you're, you're wearing that. And then it's like a subtle criticism or it's a persistence on like, oh, do you want another drink? And maybe, you, maybe um, you, like say it's myself, right? I'm saying, okay, somebody asked me if I want another drink and I say no. And then they're like, oh, come on, have another drink. And it's subtly pushing the boundaries and pushing the boundaries. Um, until it really becomes so far that it's unhealthy. It's um, criticism, it's starting to isolate and remove from friends. And those are some of the subtle or more nuanced behaviors that occur. Um, and so when we start to notice those things, instead of assuming it started with the uh, abuse mm -hmm. or physics or physical violence, I think it's more, um, it's easier to understand or easier to empathize with somebody who's become a victim of abuse. Well, and I think it's, it comes down to, it's kind of about, it's about ways of controlling someone else, right? And, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what it's at the root of it, whether it's about, uh, you know, physical violence, emotional violence, or as you said, sort of this financial control, it really is about ways to exert your control, exert control over someone else. Right. And Ab absolutely. It, it very much is, is about that. And I it's think so. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I was, I was just gonna add, it very much is about uh, control. It's very much about trying. And again, it's, it's all subtle. It's not, you know, people don't generally give up control of their lives uh, from one day to the next. It's a subtle process of, you know, just these little tiny tweaks on wardrobe, tiny tweaks on, you know, who you can talk to, um, who you can go out with, those types of things that, that began the, the cycle of control. And you, you mentioned that people will sometimes say, gosh, I would never let that happen to me. And, and people I think sometimes also say, you know, why doesn't she just leave? Mm -hmm. So can you speak to that? Why is relationship violence so insidious and why is it so incredibly difficult to just leave? Yeah, um, you know, there's a number of reasons why leaving is difficult. I and mean, we talk about, you know, fear and anxiety. When, you think about relationships, we all enter into relationships because we care about somebody. We want the, we want the companionship, we want to be cared for, we want to be loved. And so not every moment in an abusive relationship is bad. And you know, going back to the cycle of control, it's very much about courting someone. It's about getting that, making them feel like they're the center of your world, right? It's it's this sense of like, oh, I, I just don't want you out because I miss you too much. And then there's an escalation of violence that occurs or a tension building that occurs. And in that tension building, it's very much around blaming the victim um, and blaming them for all the things that are happening. Then the abuse occurs. And then after that, there is a honeymoon phase. It's, I'm so sorry that happened. I just, I get so worked up. And it's, it's the honeymoon phase that I think convinces women that, um, and I'm, I'm using women as the dominant, but it, it, it does cross socioeconomic and it does impact men as well. Um, but it, it, it's, that, it's that courting phase again, that it's like, maybe I misunderstood what just happened to me. Maybe I was wrong. Um, I think part of it is also, or I would say a part of it is also how we ask the question. We often say, why does she stay? Um, but we don't often ask why he abuses. And so that becomes a question too, mm -hmm. is there's something about understanding why the person is abusive and what that means and, the, and understanding that dynamic to create some compassion for the person who's found themselves in this situation. You know, nobody starts a relationship saying that's what I want for myself. People start at believing that they're gonna be loved um, and then getting out of some, a situation where they're not 100% sure something bad is happening is pretty difficult. Well, and I mean, everything that you, 
everything that you were saying just hit me in an incredibly personal way. I, uh, I may have shared this with you before, but I, I grew up in a, in a home where violence was a part of, of our everyday lives. My stepfather was abusive physically and emotionally towards my mom. And I watched that, that kind of cycle that you described the, you know, sort of tension building, blaming violence, you know, apology cycle kind of build and execute time and again. And, and over the years I watched him isolate her and chip away at, at her self-confidence and just destroy her, her self-esteem. Um, and all of that, that kind of deterioration makes it that much harder to, to pick up and go. And you mentioned also that one of the things that, that human options is really focused on is ensuring that you know, once you get someone over those really big and hard hurdles, that housing and housing security is something that that isn't another hurdle. So can you just talk a little bit more about about that and about the the ways that you've been able to to provide that safety and security for for victims of abuse? Sure. So when it comes to housing, we have the 24 hour hotline and um, we use that really as a way for people accessing help. So sometimes we'll get a call and it's really around sharing their story, telling us about the abuse, trying to get a good sense of what is it they need. Um, if the emergency shelter is a good op is the good option for them. So you know, many are unsure that they want to leave. They're unsure whether they're actually in an abusive relationship. Um, so if the emergency shelter is the, the appropriate way, they will come into our emergency shelter and our case managers will help screen and then develop a plan that is in the best interest of that particular um, client. That, that individual really has a lot of say in the type of program they want to follow. They can um, be in the emergency shelter, transition to permanent housing. Um, we can, if, for example, they have not been allowed to work or um, it's been a while and they need to build their resume, or in some cases, housing, housing is impacted by bad credit. So if the abuser has run up their credit, um, made you know broken leases and done those things, um, then she's going to have a hard time finding a new place. And so we, we clear those things up via our legal advocacy program and then find them a permanent housing. Um, in this last year, we've also found um, the ability using the DV housing first model to now, if somebody is coming into the emergency shelter or calling the hotline, if um, if it's somebody where we are able to assess that maybe we can revert them from the emergency shelter, so really um, keep them from entering the emergency shelter at all and getting them into some type of permanent housing or stable housing, then we'll, we'll actually not put them in emergency, move them directly to their own house and then offer supportive services, which is hugely beneficial. And then our walk-in centers, again, I, I mentioned emergency shelter is not for everybody. Um, we've had plenty of families who really want to do whatever is possible to stay in their own home. And so we work with them on how do we create safety within the home, i.e. Um, maybe it's the abuser that needs to leave, or if there's another place that we can help them create and build a home without coming to emergency shelter by providing counseling services, by providing psychoeducation, then that is really what's key. It's helping anybody beginning where they're at and then um, putting them on a path to healing. Well, COVID-19 has, has transformed our world in so many ways. Uh, what has been the impact of this pandemic on the, the relationship violence? What are you seeing? Um, so I'll say that in some ways, I think um, maybe silver lining has been, which is interesting to talk about a silver lining during the pandemic, but in some ways silver lining has been, there's a, there's a, a lot more interest in the issue of domestic violence, which is critical. Right? It's critical because we've had media attention because I think um, it's, it's now really easy to understand that being at home is not always safe. And so really understanding that message of being home is not safer for many victims of domestic violence. Um, on the flip side of that though, the unsafe piece of it is that many of um, those that are being abused now have no reprieve. And so what we're finding is because the abuser is home with them, because the kids are home with them, there is no longer that opportunity to call for help where somebody would have called um, either our hotline or 911, there's no room for that um, where you know, we talked about the cycle of 
uh, power and control and that reprieve or that honeymoon phase that gets shorter and shorter when there's no room to go that goes you know you go from okay i'm going to go for a walk or i'm going to go to the grocery store and that's not happening and now there isn't that space in between these arguments and so what we found is many of those that are coming into the emergency shelter the stories of abuse are more extreme where in a year we may have gotten you know, about 10 percent or maybe 15 percent that were um, more related strangulation cases or severe stalking cases we're seeing that at 40 and 50 percent right now which is again very extreme um, where sometimes abuse is minimized. In one week, we had five families come in, three of which were strangulation cases. And, and strangulation um, is very lethal. And so the longer this goes untreated, the more severe these cases become. Um, we've had, you know, again, children with nightmares, children that are now um, in situations where they're very, very anxious because again, there isn't that reprieve. Um, and some of the stories we're hearing about just the um, very, are very like expansive plans to keep somebody from leaving um, have been actually pretty, pretty surprising. It, it, it's just so, it's so sad to know that for so many people, as you said, it's, it's not safe. It's not safe at home. It doesn't feel safe. You mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you mentioned children. So let's talk a little bit about, about what does happen if, you know, when children are, are present and parts of families where relationship violence is occurring. Yeah. You know, I think for kids, it's very confusing. It's um, watching your, your parent be abused, um, trying to understand what's happening. I think in, initially there's a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, we find, uh, you know, two, ex two extremes is what we've experienced for a child who um, maybe would speak and um, had a lot of energy all of a sudden becomes um, their language skills sort of deteriorate and they won't talk anymore. So they they um, are shy and withdrawn. Um, others who become outwardly aggressive. So instead of turning inward, they're outwardly expressing their anger and their emotions and they're having outbursts. And, and um, the parent who's being abused is typically the one who's trying to navigate those issues. We've had um, you know, they have night terrors, um, maybe they're having some struggles at school because they can't focus. All of those things begin to sort of eat away at the child. I think most children, what we find is they, it's very difficult when you see your parent and you see a parent who the abusive parent is, is harming and then the other parent is having trouble um, taking care of themselves, right? And, and, and it's hard for kids to reconcile that. And so kids usually turn it into like, there's something wrong with me, right? There's something wrong with me. If this is happening between my parents, I must be doing something wrong. And the more that happens is the more they begin to internalize these feelings of self-worth or they're not worthy enough. I'm broken. I could have done something. And that begins to erode self-esteem and again, create this issue of like, I, I'm not good enough. Um, which then puts them on a path of like not being able to resolve those emotions. And if a parent then can't come back and talk about that. Um, so if the, if, um, you know, when, when I'm going to, I'm going to use a mom in this situation, if a mom then ha comes to the emergency shelter and say brings Johnny with her and Johnny is exhibiting tantrums and crying um, and the mom still hasn't really worked through all of these emotions that come with being abused she's not going to be able to check in on Johnny and say, Johnny, you know, it's okay. And tell me what's happening and what's worrying you. And so instead Johnny sits with that and keeps that in, um, which is not healthy for Johnny or the family. Well, and I know you, you said uh, earlier that and hurt people hurt people. Mm -hmm. And one thing we see is that this cycle of violence, it's not just, you know, in that relationship, it becomes a generational, a generational cycle. And so I it's how do we create uh, safe spaces for, for kids to heal? And how do we break that, break that cycle in our own lives? Mm -hmm. When it's and it's so important, right, to to really listen, to listen to both the child and listen to the parent. I think again, every interaction. Um, is the child is watching every interaction, whether it's between their parent uh, or, you know, between their parents, they, they watch an interaction when mom reaches out for help and mom isn't believed or somebody brushes mom off. Mm -hmm. All of those interactions get sort of tucked away in that child's mind as, oh, 
well, maybe this is okay. Or, oh, hmm. I didn't believe mom. Or, you know, I, I've, um, over the course of my career or time at Human Options, I've heard so many stories where a, a child who is now an adult will say, I went with my mom to get help. Um, they asked her to fill out a bunch of papers. She wouldn't do it. And we left. And that was the last time my mom asked for help. And I was so mad at her. Mm. And then getting to a point of realizing how difficult it must be for someone in crisis who's fleeing abuse to be asked to fill out a stack of papers mm. instead of being really heard in that moment. And so if there, you know, if there are, if there are people that are, are listening to this from home who who need help, what what can what can they do right now? I think that a uh, couple of things. If if somebody at home is being a, is being hurt, definitely reach out for help. You can call our hotline at 877-854-3594. If there's somebody that you know that is being um, hurt and that maybe isn't comfortable sharing, reach out to them, stay connected, tell them you're there for them. Um, it's really difficult to leave and it's really difficult to take that first step. They need to know that you'll be there regardless of whether, mm -hmm. for whenever they're ready and if they're not ready that you're gonna be of support. Um, again, it's showing somebody that they care and they matter and that they're valued because the whole message they've been told is that they don't matter mm -hmm. and that no one will believe them and that nobody will care. And so anything you can do as just somebody in our society and in our community to make that person feel loved and respected and to help them see they don't deserve to be abused is key. And, and leaving can often be not just hard, but also really and truly dangerous. So you know, what are the, some, some of the things for, and again, I'll, I'll use women though, I, I know it yeah. affects women and then you know, for women, who are trying to, to leave an abuser, what, what are some of the, the things that, that she should be mindful of to ensure that it's, it's safe? Yeah, so that's often, you know, I, um, I think what I wanna say is um, oftentimes the person who's being abused knows their abuser very well. And so they know what the warning signs are. They know when mm -hmm. something's coming. Um, 100% focus on your safety all, as, as much as possible and uh, reach out to someone couple of things in terms of a safety plan is if you are, if, um, if you are concerned and the abuse is escalating, reach out to a neighbor, reach out to a friend, let them know that um, ways that they can identify if things have gone out of, out of hand at home. Um, sometimes it's, you know, leaving a, a, a porch light out on during the day, right? If you see my mm -hmm. porch light on, can you come check? On me? If I maybe make a hand gesture or use a particular word, can you come check on me? Um, you know, having those types of things, creating a safety plan, knowing if you, within your house, is there an area you can go to where you can be safe? We recently actually had someone who um, described traps in various areas of the home that were set up in case she tried to leave. Um, those are the things that most vi abuse victims will, will deal with. And so understanding where those are and understanding where is it in the house that I can go where there aren't any weapons that can be used against me, where I can get out quickly. Um, those are things that are important when thinking about leaving. Um, and again, um, calling the hotline at 877-854-3594 becomes important. And just even if you just need someone to talk about to understand um, what is it, what is the next step and where you're at, um, we are definitely available to listen. And I guess I, I, I just want, I want people to know that um, they're not kind of doomed to sort of be in this situation forever and that you're not doomed to kind of re repeat the mistakes that that your parents you know made um you know on either side and so what are some of the things that that we can all just be mindful of in, in terms of building healthy relationships yeah i think it's one is recognizing when there's when when you're kind of crossing that boundary um i'll say we had a, a young man call he had been married about i'd say six months um, he called one of our walk-in centers and said, you know, I've, I've been uh, married for six months. I was with my, my wife prior to that several years, never raised a hand, never wrote, raised my voice. Um, I grew up in an abusive home where my dad beat my mom. 
And he said, and things are so tense right now. I'm starting to catch myself using words I would have never used, um, becoming much more assertive. And I don't want to be that person. And so mm -hmm. for him, recognizing it early and seeking help became critically important. I think often we talk about help for the victim. Um, there is also help for the abusers, reaching help, mm -hmm. reaching out and talking to someone. Um, I think that is key. It's what I, what I want to be clear about is that um, if you are the person being abused, it is not your job to change the abuser. If you are the person who is being abusive, there is help out there. Um, and being able to take that first step to ask for help is critical. Well, thank you, Maricela. Uh, thank you for, for being here and sharing your insight and perspectives and for all the work that, that you and your, your team at Human Options are doing uh, to, to address the, the scourge of relationship violence. Before we wrap up, just you know, any other parting thoughts or, or parting words for folks watching at home? Um, I, I think just really, again, um, I wanna appreciate you having me on today and, and talking about this, this topic. It's so important. It's very easy to say that happens to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, but as you mentioned at the top of, at the beginning is it happens to more people than we would think. It happens to one in three of us know someone who is being abused. That's a, that's a pretty high statistic. And so we all have the power to help someone in need and to ensure that they're living a healthy life. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And for everyone watching, uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, just please know that if you are in a, uh, a, an abusive relationship, you do not have to suffer in silence. And there are, there are resources available and there is help available. And with that, thank you so much and have a great night.